Welcome to the Car Flip Show. My name is Justin Carper. I was a part-time flipper turned used car dealer, and each week I'll be providing information on how you can flip cars as well. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let's get into the episode. This is episode two. We'll be answering a question about at what point on a flip, do you stop fixing things? Is a point where you stop fixing? Should you fix everything? Should you fix some things? And then we're also going to be talking about a little known tool that I use, which is carpet dye and how that works. All right, so carpet dye. What is it? How does it work? Should you be interested in it? Do I use it in all my cars? Those are all questions that I get asked every time I mention the term carpet dye. It sounds really fancy. A lot of people think that there's some elaborate process, that there's some expensive toolkit that's required. Am I putting it on with a brush? What, like, How does this work? And if you're listening to the podcast, you should be able to hear this. That should be a fairly familiar sound to you. Everyone at some point has used spray paint, and that's exactly how this is applied. Um, if you're watching you know, the video portion on YouTube, you can see these cans in my hands. I've got two different brands. The two brands that I generally use are Duplicolor, which is very standard. It's very easy to come across. You can get it at pretty much any advanced auto parts. Uh, you know, so Walmart might carry a version of it. Some Walmarts, not not all of them. Uh, most of your advanced auto parts will AutoZone or Rallys. It's very easy to find on Amazon. We'll put a link below just to an example of what that looks like. For me, um, you know, I, I buy it from Advance because it's easy. It's right up the road. I have a dealership with a garage, so they deliver straight to me. I pay six dollars a can. I think in the stores it's six and some change, maybe seven something. So I get it for six dollars because they discount it for me because I asked for that. Um, and then there's the SEM. So SEM is a more color matched. You can actually get a. Um, they have a like a piece of paper with all the colors that they have available. And I'm actually going to sit this down so I don't drop it. So they have a, a color match, uh, color matching chart that you can get, and you can actually match up the carpet in your vehicle with what's on the uh, you know, the chart. So you can actually see exactly what color you need. So SEM is more color match, especially in the tans. If I'm doing a vehicle that has tan carpet, Duplicolor makes a tan. It's called Desert Sand, but it's not the best tan. Like it actually hasn't matched any vehicle that I've ever tried it on. It's a little too tan. Whereas a lot of cars are more of a beige tan, so I usually don't use it for the tans. The gray, the charcoal, the black are all really good colors for your carpets because most grays are pretty close. Um, if it's a little darker, that's not such a bad thing if you're dyeing all the carpet. Um, blacks are really easy. They have a gloss and they have a flat. I like the gloss. It gives it a nice sheen if you use it. Um, so you have the Duplicolor, which I like in those colors. They actually make a red as well. Not many cars come with red anymore. I used it once on a 1990 Corvette that had red carpet, uh, touched up some spots, but otherwise you're probably gonna use the black, the gray, the charcoal, those are more common. And for other colors that are more specific, the SEM is great, it's twice as much. Usually it runs 15, 16 dollars a can. I will put a link to that, uh, an Amazon link, just so you can see what that looks like in the show notes. But now's the question, when do you use it, or when should you use carpet dye? So do I dye every single vehicle's carpet that comes in? Yeah, no, I don't. But if you've ever been looking at a car, maybe at a car dealership, and you know the, the dealer points out, you know, look at this carpet. Isn't this amazing? Like, look how clean this carpet is. Sometimes carpet will come out and it'll look perfect, but a lot of times it doesn't. And a lot of times those car dealers have actually done the same thing. They've dyed the carpet. So for me, when I consider dyeing carpet is when I have tried to get out a stain or if a vehicle has multiple stains or maybe the carpet is faded in one spot and not in another. And it's just a glaring apparent issue in the carpet. I actually have about a thousand dollar steam cleaner. It's just under a thousand. It's a mighty light, I believe is the name of it. Um, so we use that on most of the cars that come in. It's a really nice machine it uh, heats the water up to almost boil I guess boiling because it would have to be to steam so you basically it's an extractor you put it on it shoots out the really hot water and vacuums at the same time so it can break up anything it uses a chemical solution to help um, so it breaks it up sucks it out that is you know nice to have if you don't have that you can actually use a carpet cleaner I like 409 carpet cleaner not the kind you use to clean your bathroom but they make a carpet cleaner it's like $2.47 or it's, it's under $3 at Walmart. 
You can also buy that on Amazon, but it's cheaper at Walmart. So I use that, a brush, and if you spray it on, brush it out, and then come behind it with a paper towel, you can get up a lot. You can extract stuff that way. But if I try both of those and it doesn't work, my next option is to get out the carpet dye. And basically for that, you're going to take some tape, whether you get the two-inch tape, um, you know, the blue tape like you use for um, you know, painting, painter's tape. You could use the masking tape, if I'm thinking of the right tape, the tannish tape. You don't want to use duct tape because that's going to leave residue. It actually sticks too much, but tape off what you're going to be spraying. If you're really, really careful on some vehicles, I can do it without taping, but it's usually better to run a little layer of tape. I would recommend putting you know maybe three layers of two inch tape up so you don't get any overspray. Your first time doing it, definitely tape because you're going to get overspray on it and it's going to look horrible. So tape off anything, um, you know, tape around any plastics. Um, you know, the plastics that are actually like when you get in the vehicle, that plastic right there where your feet hit, those usually come off or come out. So I would pull those off, tape around the bottoms of the seats, um, in the back, you know, the luggage compartment. If you're dying that, you can tape off the edges. Um, usually the back's pretty easy to tape off because those are pretty straight lines up in the front where you've got the center console and you know, a lot of curves that can be a little more difficult. But once you tape everything off, you hold the spray can about eight to 12 inches away. You're going to put a coat on. You're going to do the entire vehicle. By the time you finish in the back, if you've done the whole vehicle, the front probably is dry. You can, you know, just touch it, see if it's dry. There's two things you can do. What I prefer to do is to take a brush attached to a vacuum. So you have the little brush that hooks onto the vacuum. Like on a shop vac, there's a little one that's a circle with a brush around it. I like to go over the carpet with that because it's moving the carpet. So it's going to brush the carpet. So as you have sprayed and dyed that carpet, it is it comes out like a spray paint. But instead of coating, it, it soaks in. And so it's going to soak into the carpet. Now, it's not going to make the carpet look brand new forever, but it'll make it look good enough for you to sell it. And it will hold up. And other applications might be necessary in the future. But so when you spray it, Go over it with the brush, and you can just use a standard brush, but I like to use the vacuum because if anything's still on the carpet, when you brush over it, it's going to suck that out as well. So that's going to move the carpet around. Then you can apply another coat. Most of the time when I'm using carpet dye, I'm doing three coats. So first coat, it'll look decent. It'll look pretty good. And then when you go over it with the brush, you're going to see some of the color coming up from the bottom. So you brush it out with the vacuum if possible. You don't have to. You can just use your hand and go over it just to move it around. When you use your hand, you're not as likely to, I guess, disturb uh, sand or other particles that are in the carpet. So if you use your hand, you can just go over it and move it around. Once it's dry, don't do it while it's wet. And uh, so then you're going to put another coat, let it dry again, which, you know, usually 10, 15 minutes, that car uh, the carpet's usually pretty dry from the dye. So, you know, stick your finger in it, touch it, see if it's dry. And so go over it, do three coats of that, and your carpet will look much better than it did before. Now, sometimes if you have something like where uh, maybe a piece of gum is stuck in the carpet, or if the carpet is wore down to like the plastic backing, your paint will show up differently on that plastic backing or a piece of gum than it does on the carpet. Just be aware of that. But otherwise, it's a great option when you have a vehicle that is nice and it looks good, except you have carpet that is just a major eyesore. You can go over it with the carpet dye and you can actually make it look much more presentable. Uh, one of the first things people look at when they you know, stick their head inside of a car is the carpet. Um, so it looking nice is preferable. After you go over it, you dye it. It's not a bad thing to put some carpet mats in. You can get a cheap set of carpet mats for 10, you know, under $20, whether you're going to Walmart or Advanced Auto Parts. So throw a set of formats in it that match the dye. It'll help it from wearing as fast, but it's a great option, especially when you're flipping a car and you have stains that just will not come out. That brings us to our question for today's podcast. And that question is, at what point do I stop fixing things? Now, when you buy your first flip, there's going to be issues. I mean, it's hard to buy a vehicle that doesn't need something, whether it's a detail, whether there is, you know, it needs washed, maybe there's a check engine light, maybe as you're driving, you get up to a certain speed, you get a vibration in the steering wheel. Um, some people get so tied up in the little issues that they, you know, take some three months to get a car ready to flip. And that's not ideal because those three months while you're getting it ready to flip, you obviously can't sell it because you're afraid to advertise it because you think there's issues. And so it kind of becomes a, a problem cycle that people get into. There's four areas, four general areas that we want to be concerned with when it comes to vehicles. In, inside the course, um, the car flip course, which is a course that I teach people how to buy and sell cars, there are four areas that we look at specifically when buying a vehicle. So those are also the four areas that other people are going to look at when they're looking to buy your vehicles. And those four areas are the interior, 
And we talked about that a little while ago with the carpet die, and that's part of the interior. There's the exterior, which is obviously the outside of the car. There's drivability. When I was talking about the steering wheel vibrating at 45 miles an hour, that's a drivability thing. Uh, noises, clunks on turns, um, transmission issues, you know, all of that would fall into the drivability category. And then there's under the hood. And under the hood would, you know, just be the aesthetics of someone looking under the hood, obviously, or maybe under the vehicle, you know, the engine, oil leaks, those type of things. So we'll start out with interior. For me, I want to remove as many objections as I can within a reasonable context of that. So an objection would be, like we talked about with carpet, someone gets in, the carpet, you know, maybe someone had a battery. This happens a lot. I get a vehicle in and there's just, uh, you know, a vehicle had black carpet, but there's this big white circle or there's a, in, in the back of the vehicle, there's a white stain and that's someone had a battery in it. It turned over and died. The carpet battery acid is pretty, um, pretty strong. It can suck the color out of pretty much anything. If you pour it on your concrete, it's great for cleaning concrete. Don't get it on your hands, but it takes the dye right out of carpet. And so I see that that's something I'm going to take care of. If I have a vehicle with black carpet, a battery is falling over. I'm going to dye that carpet back black so that that's something when they stick their head in to look in the back of the vehicle, there's not this massive white swatch of carpet. So other things in interior would include leather, the condition of leather, um, the condition of a cloth seat. Uh, you've got things like, you know, the radio, does the radio work? Do the speakers work? Um, you know, what's the condition of the steering wheel? Anything someone can see on the interior, you know, smells would come into play here. Um, you know, if someone is smoked in a vehicle, that's not preferable or uh, not a preferable smell. If people don't want a vehicle to stink when they go to look at it. So there's, you know, someone spilled milk or you know, someone just never cleaned it on the inside. All of those things come into play here. And I want to remove as many of those objections or many, uh, as many objectionable items as I can within reason. So carpet is going to be clean. Now, if there is, you know, one little spot that has a tear, I'm going to take care of that best I can within reason. If it's a $3,000 car, people are going to expect for there to be little issues here and there. I'm not going to have a big massive hole in the carpet, but we're going to go over that the best we can. You know, tears in seats, generally I have fixed. Um, so I have an upholstery guy. If there's a rip in a seat, he could take care of that. Um, if there is in the back of the seat, you know, down by the bottom, someone had the seat folded down to haul some lumber or something. There's a small tear in the bottom of one of the seats that no one's really going to see. I'm probably not going to worry about that if it's not in a very noticeable area. So for me, I can have a seat fixed, usually under $200. I mean, sometimes it's only 70, 90 bucks. If a bottom seat cushion's messed up and he's just fixing a small area, it's not that big a deal. Cigarette burns fall into this. I actually have a video that I did on YouTube about how to fix cigarette burns. It's a pretty simple process. You can actually only use a razor blade and Elmer's glue to take care of those problems. So those are things that I'm going to take care of. I'm going to take care of cigarette burns because it's easy. Now, for example, if the dash has a crack that's not that noticeable up by the windshield. Generally, I'm not going to worry about that. Some vehicles, older vehicles, uh, vehicles that have been in the sun a lot, the sun heats up the plastic. It gets hot, it gets cold, it gets hot, it gets cold, and you're going to have a little crack that might occur in the dash. I'm probably, on a $5,000 car, not going to worry about replacing an entire dash because there's a small crack. That's where I would draw a line because to pull an entire dash out, you're looking at seven to 10 hours worth of work. Uh, it's just not going to be worth it. Some people would think that there's a crash in a DAC, uh, a crash, a crash in a DAC, a crack in a dash, if I could talk, um, that would have occurred from an accident. And that's hardly ever the case. It's just certain vehicles are more prone for the dashes cracking, certain Cadillacs, some of the old Dodge pickup trucks. I mean, some of the old Dodge pickup trucks, the entire dash would crack and just fall in, which you'll see people put covers on top of them, little fabric covers. But that's something you could explain. That, look, you know, it, it's this little crack. If someone even mentions it, someone probably won't even notice it. But you could explain, you know, these do that. You know, they sit in the sun. The windshield kind of works as a magnifying glass. It gets really hot. You know, when, pl when plastic gets hot, it gets brittle. That's the reason for the crack. Most people won't even notice a small crack. But those are things you want to draw the line on. You know, other things would include, you know, a, a steering wheel that is just really worn. Usually you can get away with just putting a steering wheel cover over that. Um, so don't go into replacing dashes. Don't go into replacing entire seats just because there's a small tear maybe in the bottom where no one's going to notice. You know, a small crack in a, le you know, in a leather seat. 
I'm not going to worry about as much as I would a rip or a tear in a leather seat. So there's definitely areas you want to draw the line. On the exterior, it's kind of the same. You know, the paint is the major area in the body condition. So if there's nicks and chips and small scratches here or there, some touch-up paint can easily take care of that. You can buy that touch-up paint for under $20. Pretty much, you know, most of them are available at most advanced auto parts. If you have a color that's not available there, you can go to a auto body supply store. They can mix the paint. And usually that's, a, an, again, another under $20 thing. If you can get them to mix up just like four ounces, a lot of them have a minimum limit or a minimum weight that they're going to uh, sell you. So if they can do four ounces, that usually runs $15 to $17. You can buy a small uh, micro applicator, which you can find on Amazon. Actually, if you search micro applicator, it's going to bring up things that people use for their eyelashes and stuff. They work great. So those will be great for applying touch-up paint. Now, if I have a massive dent in the hood, like a, a substantial dent or a dent in the door or a dent in the bumper, I'm usually going to take care of those things. If I have a small ding in a hood or a small ding in a door, a lot of times I'm going to let those things go. Some things you're able to fix yourself, such as a dent in a rear bumper. Most bumpers now are plastic, which means if you heat them up, they become a little pliable. So you could heat them up with a heat gun and then put your hand on the inside, push a dent out. It's going to look a lot better. You'll never make it perfect, but you might remove an objection. So if there's a dent in the bumper, you pop the you know pop the dent out. It's something that someone might not notice on their walk around, and so you've removed an objection. A small ding here or there, a small scratch here or there, those are things that generally aren't the biggest deals. Now, if you have several scratches in a you know in the paint, and maybe it's just gone through the clear coat, you can usually tell that if you wet it and it kind of goes away and you can't see it as bad. That's going to tell you that it's in the clear coat, which means you could buff it. So you get a buffer. You need some rubbing compound. You could even use some wet sandpaper. So if you get a 1500, 2000 grit sandpaper, you have to wet it, you know, sand over it, and then you can come back with a buffer. A lot of times those will buff out. So if you have the time, you could take care of something like that. But you want to do things within reason. You're not going to repaint every vehicle. Just because there's a small ding in a bumper doesn't mean you're going to replace the bumper. You want to do things to remove objections, but you don't want to spend $1,500 on every vehicle at, you know, reconditioning it and then lose your profit because you're making them perfect. So on the exterior, within reason, uh, drivability is a very important one. Generally, you don't want any um, major vibrations. You don't want any noises when people are driving. Those scare people. Like right now, I have a 2006 Mercury Mountaineer. When you go over a bump or if you actually are a car lot, when you go out of the parking lot, it kind of goes down about six inches on an incline. So anything in the suspension that's going to have noise, people hear right away. So you, you kind of hear a clunk clunk when you hit a bump and there are these little steering stabilizer links. They're like uh, maybe six inches. They're not that expensive. I think a set for both sides is less than $20. They're not hard to put on. That is something that we're going to fix because when someone hears that clunk clunk, when they go over a bump, they have no idea what it is. They're assuming the worst. They're thinking several hundred dollars in repairs when it's less than $20. So I'll spend $20 to remove that issue. If someone puts their car into gear and they get a big, you know, jolt, sometimes a motor mount could be worn. If it's not that bad and it's, you know, a job where the motor mount is going to take three to four hours to replace, that's something that I might leave. And if someone mentions it, if it's a deal breaker, I know what it's going to take to fix it. We could work that into a deal. Now, if we get you know, the engines you know, shaking back and forth when you shift, we're going to take care of it. But a small, you know, something someone's not going to notice, you're not going to spend $400 to fix. So you have to keep it within reason. Um, under the hood, you know, again, you're not going to fix every single thing you can't because they're buying a used vehicle and a used vehicle is going to have used components. Used components are going to be worn. So, you know, the oil pan gasket might be seeping a little bit of oil. I just had a guy that came in the other day. Um, a lady was looking at a vehicle. It was a 2006 Chevrolet um, Equinox actually. So they come in, they look at the vehicle. Um, she was looking at it and she had her friend, maybe boyfriend, I don't know the relation, but he was looking over the vehicle. He was a mechanic, pretty nice guy. Um, so he's looking over the car and he actually brought in a uh, white paper towel and he said, oh, he said, oh, you got some, you got an oil leak under there. And instead of, you know, instead of saying, oh no, I don't think it's leaking oil or instead of offering to fix it, I said, well, you know, it is a 12-year-old car. I said, it's hard to find a 12-year-old car that doesn't seep. Don't say leak. 
say seep. It doesn't seep a little bit of oil. And when she said, you know what? He said, yeah, you're right. He said, it's probably just the oil pan. So that crisis was averted because he understood. And when he understood, you know, she heard him say, it's not a big deal. So that wasn't an issue. This is actually one that did have a little bit of a vibration when you drove it. Um, I think it was in the tires. I actually was able to negotiate on the price. I didn't want to put a whole set of tires on it. So I was asking on this one, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I was asking $49.50 for it. I came down to $4,500, which I was expecting to do anyway. So for them, they felt like they could cover the tires with that $500. I'm sorry, it was $4,400, not $45. So they thought they could cover the price with the tires. So you can use that negotiation, uh, those numbers, you can move those around for issues people do you know, encounter. But I didn't want to put a whole set of tires on it. The vibration wasn't that bad. So that's one thing that I left because I didn't want to spend $600 on tires. I didn't want to replace a oil pan because it was just barely leaking. Those are things you don't have to fix. Under the hood side, if when someone starts the car and after it runs for five minutes, it starts smoking, probably something you're going to want to fix. If you have, you know, antifreeze or, you know, you have coolant that's leaking, when someone test drives the car, they come back and there's green liquid dripping out from under the car, you're probably going to want to, you're going to have to take care of that because that's going to scare someone away or else someone's going to blow your car up on a test drive because it's going to overheat. So those things you have to take care of. You know, smoke coming from under a hood most likely is something like a valve cover gasket on any engine. You have exhaust coming off, which gets very hot. Oil would be seeping from the top of the engine as it is on the valve cover at the top, would seep down, hit the exhaust, and then you see smoke. Not a big issue, but an issue that would definitely scare somebody when they see smoke coming from under the hood. Sometimes you'll even smell it inside the car. So those are issues you want to take care of. You know, you don't have to do an oil change to every single car. Those are things, even though it's minor, you don't have to do. If the transmission fluid is a little bit dirty, you don't have to change the transmission fluid. Transmission fluid is meant to go several, several thousand miles, way more than an oil change. So you don't have to do that. You don't have to put brand new brakes on every single car. Now, if a you know if brakes are squeaking or you're getting vibration when you brake, take care of that, but don't replace brakes on every single car. Don't spend that money if it's not necessary. So those are all things. There's, you know, a multitude of other things that I could talk about in conjunction with interior, exterior drivability and under the hood. But those are just some, you know, overview things that you would need to be aware of. Don't spend money that you don't have to spend because remember you're selling a used vehicle and used vehicles are going to have used components and used components show wear. So just because the control arms are a little worn or a ball joint, you know, has a tear in the boot. You don't have to replace that as long as it's not going to cause an objection for the customer. Now, if someone asks about those issues, you know, don't lie about them. Don't mislead somebody, but just expect a used car to have used issues. You actually might hear in the background my mechanic working on one of our vehicles right now. So, you know, we take care of issues as needed, but you want to you know, do those things within reason. So that's today's episode. That is episode two. I would love to be able to answer your question in the next episode. If you would like your question to be answered, you can submit it to us. There's a multitude of ways you can do that. You can do it on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash the car flip. You can post it there. If you don't want your name to be mentioned, just let me know. You can even send it in a message on Facebook. You can post it below in the comments. If you're on the show notes page, um, you can post it on the YouTube channel. If that's where you're watching this video. You can post it below in the comments. But if you don't post your question at a minimum, I would love for you to give me an honest opinion of this show. If you would like and review this, not only does it you know help us have feedback for the show to then improve the show, um, but it also allows more people to see it because the more people that like um, leave a review and subscribe to the show, it helps the algorithm on Apple and it helps other people to see the show because it'll show up in more places. So I would be eternally grateful if you would leave an honest review, um, an honest rating, and then subscribe to the show. Otherwise, I will see you in episode number three.